special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast, working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics' mission at horizontherapeutics.com. I just want everyone to just know the message that your child can. You can, as a parent, <laughs> advocate for your child or as anyone. So just that message that my son, Isaiah, gives everyone is just remember that you can. You can do all things. That's our guest this week, Alan Turner, an insurance executive and father of three children, including Isaiah, 10, who has Down syndrome. Alan has lots to say about how a special needs dad can and should help his kid be the best he or she can be. It's an inspiring conversation, and we'll hear it on this Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Now say hello to the founder of the Special Fathers Network and host of the Dad to Dad podcast, David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast presented by the Special Fathers Network, a Dad to Dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. On Saturday, May 11th, the 21st Century Dads Foundation will be hosting its fifth annual Special Fathers Network Dads Virtual Conference. This year's theme is self-care, being self-ish so you can be self-less. We've assembled a great roster of presenters and there will be plenty of time for small group breakouts so you can meet like-minded dads striving to be the best dads they can be and to help their children reach their full God-given potential. Registration is free. For more information and to register, please see the show notes or simply go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Now let's hear this inspiring conversation between Alan Turner and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Alan Turner of Mansfield, Texas, proprietor of Turner Insurance Group and father of three, including one with Down syndrome. Alan, thank you for taking the time to do a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. Thank you. You and your wife, Ebony, have been married for 23 years and are the proud parents of three children, Anaya, 19, Jael, 17, and Isaiah, 10, who has Down syndrome. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and I am the oldest of five. <laughs> so mom and dad, um, married, wonderful family, life growing up with just me <laughs> for the longest till I was eight. Then my little brother came into the picture <laughs> and then it kind of was like, that's when my mom and dad divorced and life kind of changed a little bit after that. But, you know, really enjoyed my being the only child for those first eight years. <laughs> so that was really fun. Um, but yeah, Dallas, Texas was this home for me. Really enjoyed. I just remember my dad, you know, being able to take me different places and do different things. We would go to different games, basketball games. I just remember all those different things we did. So we'll get into that a little bit later on. <laughs> but it was really fun. And then, of course, my, my little brother got into the picture. And then more siblings after that. So... That's the kind of number that. So out of curiosity, what did your dad do for a living? So my dad was a roofer, an entrepreneur, so I say. And so he would get all of the neighborhood guys, the high school kids that were older than me, and he would give them jobs and tell them to come help him, you know, work on roofs. So it was fun to kind of be with the older guys. And I'm a little kid, <laughs> so they're all like my brothers kind of looking after me. So that was fun. When you think about your relationship with your dad, how would you describe that? Uh, first eight years, me and him, totally, just me and him, that's it. And I am a junior, so obviously I'm his namesake. So it was just us. I think he was just super proud to have me. I think he was really proud to have a little little him <laughs> running around here. Mini me. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And that's what everyone says. They're like, you look exactly like him. So, <laughs> so we were that. We were really, really close, really, really tight. And then... Um, that kind of changed when my parents divorced. Partly his fault, partly my mom's fault. But you know, divorces happen. It's just their perspective. You know, as a kid, seeing it's one thing. But as an adult, I understand now. You know what was going on. But as a kid, it seemed like you know, mom moved me away from him. <laughs> it wasn't allowing me to do whatever. And then he wasn't coming around. So it's like, well, wait a minute, where are you? What are you doing? <laughs> so I kind of blamed him for not doing, but as you get older, you start seeing the different dynamics that are in relationships. So 
I understand now those things. Still felt like it could have fought harder <laughs> to see me more often, but but yeah, you know, life goes on and we all kind of learn. So, what do you think the more important takeaways are from your relationship with your dad? Maybe a lesson or two learned. One thing I always said is when I tell my kids something, I'm always going to make sure I do it, I follow through. And if anyone makes promises to my children, I always make sure that they follow through on those promises or they just don't make those promises to them. So that was one thing I noticed as a kid. If you're going to promise something, please follow through. Because as a kid, you remember. Maybe as an adult, uh, okay. But as a kid, you kind of put your whole world in on that. So those are things I always said to myself. I would make sure if I tell my kids want to do something, I need to make sure I do that so that they have that going through. Yeah, well, uh, those words are ringing very uh, strong in my ears as well, that your word is your bond, Yeah. right? If I say I'm going to do something, you can count on it. Right. And I think that the underlying characteristic is trust, right? You can trust me, right. right? And if you grew up in a very trusting environment, you might take it for granted. But if you grew up in an environment that wasn't so trusting, right. then it becomes really important to you. Right. 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 And that's sort of what I heard you saying. Yeah. Uh, Cause that was my experience as well. Yeah. So Absolutely. I'm thinking about uh, your grandfather's uh, first on your dad's side. Um, and uh, what, what did your uh, grandfather Turner do? He did a multiple different jobs. What I remember the most, one of the jobs that he did was working at the laundromat. He was the person that opened and closed it. So I thought he was so important because he had the keys to this major place. <laughs> And he could go in and shut the lights off and close the doors, you know. Now, of course, we find out later on that, you know, I'm older now, though, that's a janitor. <laughs> but as a kid, I'm like, wow, you have control of this big major place. <laughs> and they trust you <laughs> to handle it. So I was able to go in when there's no one else in there and kind of walk around. So that's what he did. But really, outside of his job, what I really remember the most was a garden. He liked the garden. And so I remember going out in the garden with him and we would pick tomatoes, we would pick all kinds of different vegetables. And I just really remember spending that time with him and just kind of getting my hand in the dirt with him. And it was like a little lot across the street from our house and we, it's from my grandmother's house. And we just go over there and just kind of be in that garden all day. And he was standing there when he's not at work. That's where we would find him at. And he would go over there and just grow all kinds of things. So I liked being over there. So that was really cool. That was the best thing I remember the most about him was being in the garden with him. Excellent. How about your uh, grandfather and your mom's side, your maternal grandfather? Yeah. And I never got to meet my maternal grandfather because he passed away. So never got to have that relationship. But what I did see from my uncles and from my mother and aunt, I know he had a major influence on them. So even though I never met him physically, I still feel like I have a little bit of that from him. Yeah, well, sorry that uh, he passed away at such a young age, your mom's mm -hmm. young age. Right. And that uh, through some uncles, maybe you learned a little bit more about him and some other men stepped into your life to be right. most positive adult male role models in his absence. Right. So my recollection was that uh, you went to the University of Texas, Austin. And right. uh, what type of degree did you take there? I did computer science, computer engineering technician. I was an engineer basically for 10 years <laughs> and got tired of the industry. Or shall I say the industry started closing in on me. <laughs> During that time, there was a lot of industry closures. And if you wanted to stay in the industry, you either had to go to Europe, you had to go to Germany, or you had to go to, you know, <laughs> Samsung was one of them, you had to go to Korea. And I wasn't going to do any of that. So so I said I needed to find me something else to do. And so 10 years later, <laughs> I went to insurance. And now 17 years later from that is <laughs> where I'm at. So, yeah. So what, what was it that prompted you to go to the insurance industry? Really? I was really looking at what can I do that can be my own boss, my own business. I, I, we started having children. And I'm like, well, I want to be there with my kids, but I want to be able to have the freedom to do the things I wanted to do with them. So obviously that first two years when my oldest daughter was born and before my baby girl was born, I was working nights. So we didn't have to pay for daycare per se, 
But that was kind of rough when you're working 10 plus hour tips. <laughs> and then you come home and you have a baby at home and then your wife is going off to work. So it got a little rough. So I was like, there's got to be an easier, better way to do this. So I decided to be a home inspector as well as insurance. So I did both of them at the same time and insurance took off. Um, but yeah, the insurance world really kind of gravitated towards that and that took off and then that's where I'm at today. So, <laughs> What type of work does Turner Insurance do? Every type of insurance except auto and home. How big is your agency? How many agents do you have? We have 70 plus agents at the moment. I always want to be the one to tell them, look, I have opportunities for you. If you're willing to work, I'm willing to get those and make those opportunities happen for you as well. Because when you win, I win. But if you're just one of those where, hey, I just want to kind of you know, make a little money here and there, you can also be here as well. But I'm just not going to pour as much into you because your commitment isn't there. So, And I, and I feel that's the way in the industry. Except I'm just not going to micromanage it. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, you want to do it, come on board, and it is rewarding. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, I can identify a little bit with what you do as a financial services professional for the last, I guess, 39 years. You do have to be a self-starter, right? Somebody who, you know, is willing to put themselves out there. And, uh, you know, my business was built on cold calling. Not everybody's cup of tea. Making mm. 100 plus phone calls a day, $2,000 a month. Do the math, that's 24,000 calls a year. Yeah. And it's humbling, right? Because, uh, you need to develop a pretty thick skin. And it, uh, I think it uh, prepares you for other things in life too, right? You don't take things personally. And, you know, you can build a very successful business on like a 1% or 2% success ratio. But it does take uh, somebody who's very uh, long-term in their thinking and who's very committed, right? Like you were saying. And uh, if you put the effort out, there are rewards to be gained. So anyway, I can appreciate what you were saying. So I'm sort of curious to know, how did you and Ebony meet? <laughs> so believe it or not, we actually hung around the same circles, but we were blind date. Mm. So all mm. of our friends knew each other. <laughs> they, we, they all knew me, they all knew her, but we've never met each other. And so we were on a blind date and she stopped me after that. <laughs> that's my recollection. She won't, she won't tell you that's the same deal, but, <laughs> but, that was a pretty good blind date. And then about two weeks later, I gave her a call. And then ever since then, we've been together ever since. But yeah. So was it I, in college that you met or was it, it after was college? In college? It was in college. It was my third year. It was her fourth year and she was going off to law school. And so she was getting ready to graduate. And that's when we met. But we uh, decided to get married while she was still in law school. And then so she was able to finish her last two years of law school at the University of Texas. But yeah, long story short, we were married by five years when we started having children. So yeah, and then and then we had our kids and then this is history. <laughs> it's what yeah, well, years later. <laughs> if your experience has been like ours, it's hard to even remember what you were doing before you had kids. <laughs> so let's switch gears and talk about special needs first on a personal yeah. level and then uh, beyond. So prior to becoming parents, did you or Ebony have any connections to the disability or special needs community? Yeah. Why do you ask that question? My wife and I, of course, we met in college. That two-week period when I did not speak to her after our blind date, it's because I was coming back home to get my brother who was coming to come live with me in Austin. So I'm a 21-year-old college student, and my brother is 14 years old. My brother has... Uh, seizures. So as a result, he basically, we were kids. I'm, I guess I'm nine. He's still a baby. So he's a year, year old. One of our babysitters that we were staying with, he, they used to do snuff. This, this lady used to do like the snuff can back in the day. You spit in the can and kind of do the whole deal. Well, my, my little brother got into the can and swallowed the, the spit, the whatever in there. And that caused brain damage. That brain damage, he got meningitis and brain damage. And as a result, he had front temporal lobe damage, and which that basically caused him to be deaf in one ear, and then end up having seizures. So that's pretty much what happened. So that period of that week where I did not speak to Ebony is because I was actually going to get my brother and figure out how we can get him to Austin. When he was able to come with me, with me being college student slash working, 
kind of been able to get the things he needed, I could get that there in Boston. So he was pretty much our first kid. <laughs> my wife and I was first kids and had him for so long. But um, yeah, he's my first foray into being young and having to deal with, you know, my little brother, but calling my kid, you know, uh, uh, individual with, with special needs. Learned at an early age how to handle that. And then, of course, at the same time, taking care of my brother at that young age as well. So those would be my first forays into the special needs, you know, areas. And just kind of having a passion and a feeling for taking care of people. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, emphasizing that. You know, it was a, at a pretty young age that you got exposed almost as like a father figure to your younger brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? To be caring for him. And uh, he's very fortunate to had you play that role for him um, as opposed to not. And um, I'm sort of curious to know, what is Isaiah's diagnosis and how did that come about? So Isaiah has Down syndrome. Isaiah's born March 8, 2013. Healthy baby boy, no issues. We're looking at him. He is perfect, 10 fingers, 10 toes, screaming like he's like every baby does. It comes out. He looks great. Doctors, listen, he's perfect baby boy. Here you go. And I asked all those questions that daddy's asked. Is everything good? You good? You don't see anything wrong with everything? The doc's like, no, he looks great. He's, hey, congratulations. You know, he's your boy. He's your first boy. Enjoy. You know, congrats. So he's home. He's eating well, taking food. Everything's going well. Two weeks later, you know, we do our, you know, two-week doctor visit. We notice everything's good, but he hasn't gained any weight. He's still, you know, doing well, but hasn't gained any weight. Hasn't lost any weight but he's not gaining weight. So still a little concerning. So we're about three weeks in. He gains a little bit of weight, but not at the level he really should be. So we still not sure what's going on. My daughter goes to school. You know, kids are in school. You don't have germs. They do all the things that they do. So I don't know if my oldest daughter or my middle daughter, but someone brought, you know, some germs home and got Isaiah sick. So as a result, we're taking him to the hospital because he's coughing and wheezing and things like that. It's an emergency room at Cook's Children. One of the attendees there, they give him breathing treatments. They completely cleared his lungs out. They said, oh, he's good. He, everything's fine. Outside of the big, huge hole in his heart, he's fine. So he'll be fine. <laughs> that was our first foray <laughs> into Down syndrome. So we're like, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Hole in his heart. What are you talking about? Yeah, he has a huge heart murmur. And the only kids that have the type of heart murmur that he has are kids with Down syndrome. So we we find out first that he has this big, huge heart defect, and he's going to be surgery to get this heart defect taken care of. Oh, and by the way, the only kids that have this type of heart defect are children with Down syndrome. So we have to decide how do we deal with this? <laughs> well, the Down syndrome thing was just something that that's not a priority at the moment. The heart thing is. So we're spinning we're getting ourselves prepared for a baby that has to have heart surgery <laughs> because you're like, I have this kid that's now several weeks old now. And now you found out he's in for a fight of his life. <laughs> and we didn't know. So it felt a little blindsided. Oh, and then he also has another diagnosis that we probably should have known before he was born, but you know, still didn't know. So how do we handle that? So once we got over our initial kind of, God, why did you do this? <laughs> Which lasted For me, uh, probably about a couple of hours. (laughs) For my wife, a little bit longer, maybe a couple of days. But after that, we were like, okay, you gave it to us for a reason. Now we have to fight. And then we turned into fighting mode ever since. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been fighting for our baby boy, all of our kids, but especially Isaiah. So that's kind of where we're at now. We're in fighting mode for him so he can live the best life that he can live. So how old was Isaiah when he had the heart surgery? He had his heart surgery. He was two and a half months, so not, not quite three months yet. What were some of the fears that you and Ebony had way back when? When he was getting ready to have the heart surgery, number one, he's so little. And so how do you repair a heart that's <laughs> the size of a pea, <laughs> you know, or, or a little bit bigger than that, or, or pecan, maybe the size of pecan? Like, how do you, how do you do something like that? So just learning the, the mechanics of that. But Dr. Tam here in Fort Worth is world renowned surgeon. He was able to do this. One of the top surgeons just so happened to be here in Fort Worth, Cook Children's, where Isaiah had his heart surgery. And we were able to talk to many families that had the same procedure done. 
And they assured us that, oh, these babies bounce back, they're fine. You know, he'll have the little zipper <laughs> button down his chest. Like, so if you have any babies, any heart babies out there, you, you, you dads know what that is. And he'll be perfectly fine. And they were correct. He was perfectly fine. But going through it, you know, you hate to see your child having to go through those type of things. But he's, he's bounced back well. He's done really well. Not to focus on the negative, but what have been some of the bigger challenges over the last 10 years? So with Down syndrome, there's a developmental delay. There's just the general cognitive um, delay and everything. There's a muscle delay. So in all of those milestones that children have to meet, he was always going to be a little bit behind. So potty training can be frustrating when you have, you know, a three-year-old or four-year-old still <laughs> going around themselves, you know, certain things that he should have already been able to do. But we have to put it in perspective. He's actually learning, you know, he's like super elastic. Like he can just really like bend and do all kinds of things like that. So we look at it, wow, you have these little superpowers. <laughs> Having that extra chromosome gave you superpowers. And so with those superpowers, it's going to take some extra therapy to, to make sure that your muscles bend, that your muscles work the way that everyone else's muscles do. So we had to give him that grace and give us the permission to know that it's okay, that he's a little behind. It's okay, though, because he's doing the best that he can, <laughs> and we're allowing him to be able to do what he needs to do. But we never used the word no or can't. And so he knows that. And the other thing with him, he has no idea. <laughs> he sees his sisters and his sisters. We told him early on, this is what your brother has. And they were like, is he going to be okay? And we were like, yeah, don't treat him any differently. They were like, so he's just like, our little brother, we can beat up, do all kinds of stuff to him. I was like, <laughs> yeah. They were like, okay, cool. <laughs> and that was it. And so ever since then, he's been running with them. And so he said his older sisters were going to do all kinds of things. So he has no idea that he can't. And he, he literally is doing everything that they do. So that's really been, I believe having them has really helped him be the inspiration because they're like, to the point to where a lot of times we'll tell him to do something and he'll look over to them like, is it okay? <laughs> I, I, we're the parents, not, not them. <laughs> you know, if you ask them, they'll say they're the parents to him, but hey, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I would say the challenges would just be like knowing that he may not be at the same level as other children, but making sure that he doesn't fall too far behind. And so the fights have been in schools, have been around society, just making sure everyone understands he can do everything that you do. It may take him a little bit longer, but he can still do the exact same things. Just having that extra grace, that extra patience with him. And my job is to advocate for him as a parent because I know I'm not gonna always be here, but I need to make sure that everyone that he's around knows. Yeah, well, you've been a great advocate uh, for him. And um, I'm sort of curious to know what um, impact his situations had on his older siblings, which you made reference to a little bit, your marriage or your extended family for that matter. That's a great question. So his siblings, I can tell you this much, they've learned in their young age how to advocate as well. They've grown up with Isaiah. They see Isaiah do all kinds of things. One thing about Isaiah, he won't necessarily show you all the things that he can do. <laughs> so, and that's typical of a lot of children and individuals with Down syndrome. They can actually do more than they actually let on. So, because they get into the whole, they're so sweet, they're so sweet, and you want to just do everything for them. So, you have to kind of remember a child. No, no, no. <laughs> you can do it, let you do it. So, his siblings know that. So, whatever they see, some of their older classmates or anyone in society that's out there that has their own surgery because they'll pick up on it immediately. And they'll say, hey, you know, they can do this. You know, they can do that. So they're instantly advocating for them because they're like, and I know they can do it because my brother can. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so he has that impact on them. He's shown them the things that they can do, but also have taught them to have a voice for everyone else around them. I would say having Isaiah in our marriage it has made us stronger because we've been able to really advocate and fight for all of our kids. And it's taught us how to really not only fight for Isaiah, but to fight for all children like him. And then that extends rage goes into, well, now we have to fight for all individuals with a disability. So that you don't have to be a child, even an adult with a disability. So we have to now fight for all of you. So that's extended on to my business, as well as my wife's um, business, who's she's made it her point now 
to not only take her advocacy further, um, she's now running for public office uh, for state rep, and she's looking to try to change the laws in our state to make sure that our individuals with disabilities are represented really in our schools. That's been the biggest fight. So she's looking to make sure that our, just any individual with disability is being represented in the schools, make sure they're getting, that they basically can run. Um, right now, I think our schools look at, if you have a disability, you just can't, you can't run. And remember, we don't use the word can in our home. We use the word can. So, and everyone needs to adopt that attitude. Isaiah has really taught us that, wow, look at this child doing the things that when we physically saw him, not able to kind of turn over on his own, not able to crawl. And now he runs around like every other kid and you would have no idea (laughs) that he has Down syndrome and overcame the challenges that he did. Then we know he was able to do that. Then we know that all children can do the same thing. And so society needs to give these children. That's your teachers, that's your church leaders, that's your, you know, your, <laughs> your other people's brothers, siblings, you know, what have you. Allow people to be able to do, live the best lives that they're able to do. We'll be back with more of the conversation on the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast in just a few moments. But first, this quick message. Please help 21st Century Dads gather research on families raising children with special needs by having them complete the Special Fathers Network Early Intervention Parents Survey. A link to the survey can be found in the show notes. As a token of our appreciation, each person, mom or dad, who completes the survey will receive a great dad coin. Thank you. Now, back to the conversation. With my business, I've made sure that I'm able to advocate specifically for individuals with uh, disabilities by making sure that our insurance companies don't discriminate against our individuals with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I've worked diligently with different companies to make sure that there's products geared for individuals with disabilities who did nothing but be born a certain way. (laughs) And so if you can't discriminate against me because of my color, my race, my sex, my gender, then you should not also be able to discriminate against me because I was just born with a disability. And so that is also written in the law, but it's not practice when we look at our insurance laws. So that has been a fight that um, I've had to do. And, and it's kind of worked out. We're getting some products, some different things that are working now. So Isaiah has caused that change within my wife, within our marriage, within my children, within my business. And as a result, we're seeing that kind of change throughout just our little area where we're at, but it's it's growing and growing and growing. And so that's a result of Isaiah. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Um, I'm sort of curious to know, what has your IEP experience been? <sighs> Not fun. <laughs> but I'll tell you my approach to the IEPs. When I go into a room and I talk with the teachers, because everyone knows, if you ever been into an IP, we all know the art meeting, everyone knows. You go in, everyone around the room is the expert of your child, and you as the parent come in and you're just kind of listening to what they tell you that your child can do. And then you take their recommendations and then you're supposed to sign off and say, okay, great. And then you leave. And then of course, every time you leave, you go, go, go away going, this doesn't reflect my kid at all. <laughs> this isn't quite what we want, but you don't have the voice. So you don't realize you have a voice to say, hey, no, that's not, I don't like this. So because I advocate the way that I do, every meeting that we go into, I lead the meeting. They always say, you know, who everyone is around the tables and all of that. But then I pretty much go first and I tell them, you know, obviously, this is mom, I'm dad. And let me tell you about Isaiah and the things that he can do. And so I know my child, I know what my child is capable of doing, and I know the things that we wanna get him at. And so I always approach this as he's my child at home. When he's here at school, I'm I'm entrusting you to give him at the same level where we want him at. I wanna make sure you're able to do the same thing at school. And I wanna work with you to get him there. So that approach, Every time they come and say, well, these are the things that we can't do, we can't do, or these are the things that he can't do and he's not able to show, I'm able to go back and tell them, well, let's negotiate. How do we get this done? How do we, you know, how do we do all these things? Now, granted, eventually after we go back and forth, they're going to settle on something. Following the IP has been a struggle. (laughs) Part of that struggle is they'll tell us one thing, yes, we're doing it, and then we'll find out that actually they're not following the IEPs. 
This is also part of the reason why my life is running um, for a state rep. There's really no accountability for not following the IEPs. So we want to make sure that there's some type of accountability there. Now, part of the other issue of not following the IEPs is there's lack of funding. So if these schools don't have funding, then they can't give you the people that they need to make sure that they're able to follow the things that they need to do for the IEPs. And so it's all a, a funding issue. It's really all a legislative issue that needs to be tackled. And I think our legislators forget or don't really think about those children in that situation. So this is why we're why we're doing what we're doing. So when you ask that question about IEPs, I think we have an understanding now after fighting and fighting and fighting with our school, the expectations that we have of them, of what they can do. But we also know now that their hands are tied. And so with their hands being tied, I give you a little bit of grace. I get you're not able to do what I need you to do for my child. So now I can't beat up on you when you really don't even have the ability to do it. So I have to go above. And, and so that's why that fight has led where we're at now. So yeah, yeah, IEPs have been difficult <laughs> and they get more and more difficult. After about two years in a school, they may start seeing things your way. But then, you know, if you change schools, you switch schools, it's like you're starting all over again. And so that's what's been frustrating. And every parent I've talked to has had the same situation. <laughs> no one is, is, you know, not having to fight this fight. So. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for being so open and authentic about the experience. Uh, one of the things that I heard you say was that instead of being passive, you're, you know, more intentional, you lead the meetings, right? Yeah. Um, which I think is a good first step. And you're quick to emphasize what he's capable of as opposed to what he's not capable of. And that you embrace the fact that uh, you're his first teachers, right? As his parents. And he's going to be spending X number of hours a day or a week in the classes, but you're taking responsibility for being his first teachers. And it is unfortunate there's a lack of accountability, but without advocating like you do or like Ebony does, why would it change or why would things improve? So I admire you for your commitment, not only on Isaiah's behalf, but you know, in the broader population. So let's try to focus on the positive, which I know is your way of doing things. I'm thinking about supporting organizations. What are the organizations that have played an instrumental role either on Isaiah's behalf or on your family's behalf? One, I would say it's been a real strong, helped us a lot, the Down Central Partnership of North Texas, which I am a board member of. I've been a member of since Isaiah was born. And then of course I joined the board later on. They've been instrumental in getting us connected with the different types of organizations that we needed to be involved with. So I would say they would be the gateway to connecting you to, they would be the hub, shall I say. And they can they have all the resources that connect you where you needed to go. So they have been a strong, strong, strong support for our family. Another organization that was awesome, everyone that's familiar with TCU, Texas Christian University, they have one of the strongest programs, which is one of the only ones that are my acknowledge that I know of in Texas, they have a learning school and they basically from ages 18 months to six years old, they specialize in making sure that children with Down syndrome, specifically Down syndrome, they make sure that they're able to get them up to walking, talking, and basically get them up to school age. So our kiddos that come from TCU, Kinder Frogs, and they call it Kinder, like kindergarten, Kinder and then frogs, like horn frogs, <laughs> which is their, their logo. They call them kinder frogs. They get them completely ready for school so that our children, when they go into uh, kindergarten, they're at the same level as the rest of their peers. So I would say those two organizations have been just awesome. There's also a newly formed organization that I'd be remiss not to mention, the Black Down Syndrome Association. That organization specifically looked at individuals of color, black children specifically. Um, we have our own unique needs as parents. Our community, a lot of times, does not know about the resources, does not know how to go about finding those resources. And that Black Down Syndrome Association is just like the Down Syndrome Partnership of North Texas. They're like a hub. And so they connect those families, those black families, to other families and other organizations so that they can also get those resources that are needed. So 
I would say those have been just really instrumental in making sure that our family is where we need to go. Plus, you know, friends, you know, church church groups and all the, that good stuff. But um, yeah, those I would say would have been the main three organizations that really kind of got us where we needed. Yeah, thanks for sharing. It's uh, encouraging to hear about them. So in a prior conversation, you mentioned that uh, there's two associations, and I don't remember if it was Calstar Corporation or what the connection was, but I'm wondering if you can share with our listeners about that. That's correct. So as I was telling you, Isaiah has caused advocacy on every front of our lives, and so in my business as well. Part of what happened is I started contacting a lot of my insurance companies, some of my go-to insurance companies. One of them I would not mention by name, <laughs> but they were instrumental in helping me. I had a young individual, healthy, completely healthy individual that happened to not down surgery, but had something else. Well, their insurance company denied them. And they said, well, our insurance worker said that we can't, you know, have anyone with this as an automatic denial. Well, this individual was working. Uh, this individual was doing great. Their life expectancy, just in general, uh, for an individual that was born with that, it's like to age 66. So why are you denying <laughs> coverage for an individual just because they were born that way? And so I told them about the facts of how folks with Down syndrome are living a lot longer lives, a lot more productive, because we've now learned with research, the more you get them started early, <laughs> you know, with therapies and all of that, they can live just as fruitful and you know, wonderful lives as everyone else. This particular insurance company was not aware of all of the facts that was presented. So of course they presented it to their head underwriter. That head underwriter said, hey, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I don't know how we can make any changes, but I want to go about trying to help you with that. So they connected me with some partners out of California. Those partners in California have developed what they call the CalStar organization. And what the CalStar group, CalStar's Cal, or like California, C-A-L, and Star, S-T-A-R, they do group life insurance. So it's a guaranteed uh, life insurance product. And what that does is for any individual 18 to 74 years old, if you are looking for health insurance, they're guaranteed issue health insurance policies. That allows for our families who have not been able to get their loved ones any insurance. Now they're able to get some type of insurance plan. And so not only is it life products, their health products, their um, uh, indemnity type products, meaning their critical illness policies, guaranteed issue, their um, dental, your vision, all those different things. So one thing as an agent, um, every time I walk into a family's home, I want to be able to help everyone from the babies all the way to my seniors. And so if you're an agent, you're truly out there helping the family, you don't ever want to walk into a home, a family of five, let's say, and you're able to help all four people in the family, but the one that has a special needs you can't help or a disability you can't help. So I wanted to always make sure that I had something to be able to offer that. So that's where that program uh, came about and just all the different things that they offer. And so that is uh, one of the things that we do through my company. Um, and you can access that whole program through my uh, website, which uh, I guess I'll let you know. It's www.turnerinsurancegroup.net. And if you look on there, they're called Guaranteed Issued Products. And those Guaranteed Issued Life Products is life and health. Those Guaranteed Issued Products will allow you to be able to get 20-year term, $20,000 term life policy, Guaranteed Issued and allow you to be a critical illness policy, which covers up to thirty grand, up to thirty thousand dollars. You can get critical illness, any type of critical acute illness that hits your family. Those things are available in there. So, thank you for asking about that. But I am proud, and we're we're getting more and more companies every day getting involved in that because they're starting to see the need. You're leaving a whole demographic out. And so we need to make sure that we are covering that demographic, especially with technology being what it is. The, that demographic is living. They're living long lives, long, and they're having families. And so they need to be as protected just like you and I. So we need to help them move. And so this is one way of slowly getting that there. So I just felt like I wasn't sure if I needed to do a lawsuit at first because I was like, you guys are discriminated against someone who is able to live. <laughs> and, and all they did was be, they had the crime of being bored <laughs> with a disability. That's actually discriminatory. And so they agreed and said, hey, let's figure out another way to be able to do this. So this is another way of being able to get this done. But more and more companies are finding out about it and they're getting on board. 
Well, thank God for organizations like uh, CalSTAR Corporation. Yeah. I also remember you saying something about uh, EMA, Emergency Alliance Membership. What is that or how does that connect to That's everything correct. else? So what is EMA, the Murder Emergency Alliance Group? They are the ones that are that are doing that particular 20 grand life insurance policy. They're the ones that do that. And so the EMA Alliance, that particular group is just like an AARP or a AAA group or whatever. Those are associations that you would have to join. Once you join the association, you know, you pay a $25 one-time fee and you get access to theme parks and movie tickets and all kind of discounts you get along in that association is where that $20,000 uh, term life product is available. And it's only available through them. And so, yes, it is through Colonial Life. Uh, that is the company that underwrites it, and that's the company that's giving it to you. But if you were to call Colonial Life, they would never offer you that product because it's a specialized product that's only through the EMA association. So EMA is an association that you are, you will be joining. And then, of course, in that association is where you're going to take advantage of that life product. So thank you for asking about that as well. And what was the other one? It was like Wellness for America. That's correct. So Wellness for America is also the same type of associations. You know, there's two different ones, but it's just an association as well. And what it does, it allows you to be able to get your critical illness, that product that I was telling you about, the critical illness product. It allows you to be able to get your accidental policies, your uh, accident health, uh, any of those type of things that most individuals don't have, they're able to get. Yeah, well, um, thank you for sharing. I'll be sure to include some information in the show notes so it'll make it as easy as possible for right. somebody to learn about that. So I'm thinking about advice now, and I'm wondering um, what advice specifically you might have, Alan, for a younger dad who finds himself with uh, a diagnosis, whether it's Down syndrome or something else. What I would say to the younger dads, you're not in this by yourself, so don't... Don't take it on yourself. Don't feel like, wow, I uh, was it my fault? <laughs> Did I do something? You know, I always tell my young people who I talk to, when I'm saying young people like they're young, um, but the younger dads that, that have found themselves in a diagnosis situation, you have one day to feel bad for yourself, to feel, you know, feel however you need to feel. I'm going to give you that one day. The next day, you need to fight for your child. Okay? So I always tell individuals, it's okay. Get it out. Whatever you need to get out that first day, get it out. After that, you start advocating for your child. No one else is going to do it but you. And how you advocate is you start asking questions. And you don't stop until you get the answers that you're looking for. And if that doctor or that social worker or that family member in the world tells you can't, then you move on to the next one until you get a I can't answer. So that's what I would tell you younger dads. Just God gave you this child, and it's your job to advocate and fight for your child, just like you fight for all your children. So this isn't really, oh, my child has special needs. This is, you have a child. It is your responsibility to fight for that child. Whether they were born with special needs or they were just, you know, regular, you, you know, just doesn't matter. That's your job as a parent. So fight for your kids, all of your kids. Treat them as if they're able to do it as everyone else because they care. And just keep continuing asking questions. Whatever questions you have, just keep asking and advocate. I just always say advocate, advocate, advocate. Not just for your child, but for your loved ones, for your older individuals, your parents, you know, your grandparents. And we're in that generation where, you know, we have to take care of our parents and our children. So we need to make sure we're fighting for both of them. And if one thing I know about this life, if you don't get out of it <laughs> unscathed, <laughs> you more than likely will have a disability. I don't care what it is. If you break your arm, you now have a disability. <laughs> you're, you're, you can grow out of that disability because your arm is going to heal. But you have a disability for a certain period of time. So you have to think of it in those terms. You broke your arm. You have to get some assistance to help you heal to get better. Sometimes you may not ever get better from it. But there's aids, there's adaptive things to help you get there. So it's your responsibility or the person around you, your loved one, to make sure that they go and help you get those adaptive things that you need so that you can live the best life that you can. Yeah, well, I love it. It's a crystal clear message. Uh, you're not by yourself. You need to be the best advocate you can be for your typical as well as atypical kids. And uh, be positive. 
emphasize, you know, what is possible as opposed to, you know, maybe what might be more difficult. I'm sort of curious to know why is it that you've agreed to be a mentor father as part of the Special Fathers Network? <laughs> why have I agreed? <laughs> because I actually do this already. This is just something I already do. <laughs> it's already in me. So, <laughs> so I have no problem with mentoring. But um, I was purposely, you know, trying to advocate for my brother, make sure he was okay. I did not mention I have to go back and mention my godson, Isaiah, Isaac, excuse me, my godson, Isaac in Austin. He was born with Fleischer's disease. And so he is wolf her bound. He um, has to wear splits on his arms. And he was not even supposed to live past the age of 18. He's 19 years old now. And so... He is still here. He is still thriving. He is doing all kind of awesome things. His mom, Benet, has fought single-handedly to make sure that people are aware of his disease, that they're aware of the things that he's able to do. And she is really just out there doing the thing for him. So very proud of her and very proud of him. And so, you know, I, I've met so many people, wonderful people, and, and, and seen so many lives of folks, you know, that have changed. So... It's my job. I, I don't think we're giving things and not, that we're supposed to just take it all in and don't, don't receive. You don't give out. So I think that's my responsibility. All the things that I've learned, I need to make sure that I share with my community. And so I consider all of you all my community and anything that I know, I need to share that with you all. So that's why I have no problem with being a mentor and sharing those things. Yeah, well, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for being part of the group. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? No, I do want to thank you for allowing me to be able to speak in this podcast <laughs> and kind of share a little bit of my story. Isaiah, we have a, a walk that we do every year, and his team, he has an I Can team. And it's done on purpose. We call him I Can. Isaiah's I Can Do All Things Through Christ. That strengthens me. And his team is called I Can. And so I just want everyone to just know the message that your child can. You can, as a parent, <laughs> advocate for your child or as anyone. So just that message that my son, Isaiah, gives everyone is just remember that you can. You can do all things. So That's fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So let's give a special shout out to Ron Janowicic, uh with Special Strong in Colleyville, Texas, for helping connect us. Yes, yes. Thank you, Ron. Shout out to you, brother. If somebody wants to learn more about your work or to contact you, what's the best way to do that? Um, you can always reach me, of course, at my website. I'll, I'll plug that again, the www.turtleinsurancegroup.net. Again, that's T-U-R-N-E-R, insurance, I-N-S-U-R-A-N-C-E, group, G-R-O-U-P, dot net. And that's a great way to be able to find out more about my company, more about the different products that we offer, and just a little bit more about me and what we do. And, and I try to update that page at Joy Matter. <laughs> but I will be updated with more of our advocacy work because we also advocate as well. And so that's going to be a great way to follow us and see, you know, what you can be doing and some of the examples of what we're doing. Excellent. We'll be sure to include that information in the show notes. Alan, thank you for your time and many insights. As a reminder, Alan is just one of the dads who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concerned. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Alan, thanks again. Thank you. And thank you for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. 
Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stcenturydads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.